Thank you, guys. Yeah. Thanks for being here. Thanks. Um, so as we said, we're going to have a conversation with Ephraim Asili. Um, his films were kind of in the middle. Um, many thousands gone and Kenda. Um, but first, I always kind of want to start off talking about the, the origin story of black radical imagination and kind of how me and Amir got to it. Um, so it was something that, it, you know, started four years ago. Um, we we're both film programmers in our respective cities, Los Angeles and Chicago, and we're, you know, invested in black cinema, but mainly black independent cinema, um, and kind of looking at the variety of that. Um, but we're, you know, realizing that a lot of this work wasn't being shown. Um, it was largely, largely in the digital realm, and um, there weren't really spaces provided for it. Um, so at that time, I was really into Afrofuturism and um, those ideologies. But, um, you know, we were thinking about a few things. Um, one, how does this new digital realm and new media and new technologies um, allow folks who have been historically marginalized from the production process, from the film production process, in making this work? Um, which was really transformative in saying that, you know, this digital realm kind of provided this new space where there weren't the gatekeepers or the studio system and those things don't exist, but rather you have this direct um, access to your audience and also to crowdfunding. And it was, you know, very much this new generative space for people to tell their own stories um, as opposed to the dominant film industry where a lot of stories are being told um, for people of color, for women, um, and we kind of get boxed into these caricatures or these stereotypes. So um, looking at um, kind of thinking about Afrofuturism in that sense, um, this advent of the digital realm. Um, and then also we came to the title Black Radical Imagination from uh, this great book by Robin D.G. Kelly called Freedom Dreams, Black Radical Imagination. He's an amazing scholar based in Los Angeles. Um, but this book is basically um, chronicles all of these different liberation movements that um, black folks have actively led. And essentially, he just says, you know, without the, the foresight of imagination without the desire to imagine a new future, um, all of these movements wouldn't have happened. And it, it's just kind of that simple reminding that the imagination is kind of the nexus of um, these, these mass major movements. And so we were thinking, well, what does that mean for cinema? And what does that mean for you know a larger African diaspora in the cinematic conversation? Um, and so that's kind of the question we've really been um, pushing with these past four years. And I don't know if we found the answer, but we found some great filmmakers. Um, so yeah, is there anything you want to add to that? Uh, not really. It was like a pleasure to include Ephraim in this program and uh, have his new film show. Um, and all your films are like around like a whole series. I'm like many thousands is like the third film in the series, and I'm like I like Kenda is the like fourth film. Um, is, I'm interested in how you went from many thousands to Kenda uh, within the whole like whole overall series. Um, well, the series sort of started out as um, a way for myself. I had spent a lot of time sort of in. Uh, activist circles and um, that sort of space prior to becoming an, a filmmaker. And I spent a lot of time in Jamaica, out in the hills, in different places. And there's a sort of, um, in terms of this uh, imaginative space, uh, there's a whole sort of mythology that goes along with this culture of resistance. Um, some of it based on fact, some maybe not, but you know, identifying as someone who is a black African American or even just African, but living here, I felt like I really needed to kind of make some, I feel like I really need to have a concrete experience with the places that I'm sort of creating or participating in mythology around. Um, and so I had shot a couple films on the continent in Africa and I wanted to shoot something in terms of Brazil that had, um, 
I wanted to shoot in a place that wasn't on the continent but had a large um, African population and a sort of rich history there. Um, and so I chose Salvador um, as a place to shoot. Um, but making these films, you know, making all these films with money just out of pocket. And so, you know, um, plane tickets are very expensive. And then in making Many Thousands Gone, I had a lot of technical issues with the camera that I brought, some of what you can see in the film. Um, and so when I went to make the next film, um, I decided that, you know, it'd be nice to work somewhere a little bit more local. Um, and I'd had this sort of background of traveling in Jamaica. So I decided, you know, it'd be nice to shoot a film there. And the village where I shot the film was kind of where, I mean, this is years before I made films, but um, I still consider that village the place where this project sort of, the seed was planted in terms of building with the elders there and them kind of being like, you know, you should go here, you should go there, you, you know, this is what you need to do and then come back. And so it's kind of what I did. And then, um, you know, the series of your films are all shot on 16. And I just wanted to know, what, what is your relationship to 16 millimeter and, you know, this physical processing of your film? And also, who, who are the legacy of filmmakers within that 16 realm that you're really looking towards when you're creating your work? Uh-oh. Um, <laughs> tough, tough question. Um, well, from the beginning, I mean, I, I came into 16 millimeter film after I had made films for a while and I had been asking myself these sort of questions around what is black cinema? Like, how do you describe or define that? And um, I'd always kind of, as much as I admire a lot of the sort of black filmmakers that maybe not we all know, but say, I don't want to get into names, but a lot of narrative uh, black filmmakers, they're fantastic. But I've always felt as though, so long as you're buying into a situation where you need a lot of money, millions of dollars to make a film, it's almost inherently like, as good as they may be in reference to black culture, it's great, but it seems like, um, I've always felt like we needed to be able to work just totally outside of that with not so much resources. And then going historically, I feel like there wasn't a lot of film that I was finding and I sort of accidentally uh, kind of fell into 16 millimeter film because I found like oh there's a whole body of work where people are just literally picking up the camera and making films um, no cast no crew no budget no producer and improvising and it's like this reminds me of black music essentially and then the further you get into it you realize how a lot of the origins of that work was rooted in uh, you know black poetry or black jazz music etc and so I think there's a lot of um, aesthetic influence within 16 millimeter film, the history of the American avant-garde has a lot of uh, black influence, although you don't necessarily see it from the filmmakers. And so that was something that I wanted to sort of kind of claim in a way um, by simply working in that mode. And it seemed to fit for my project where I am able to improvise and kind of bounce around and work very quickly, um, just kind of where that came from. Uh, in terms of influences, um, it's funny, like, the first film for me that made me even be interested in sort of alternative modes of filmmaking was um, Symbiopsychotaxoplasm, which was something I saw as an undergrad when uh, a friend of mine brought it to class one day and he's like, you got to see this film. Miles Davis did the score. And I'm like, oh, yeah, cool. Like, you know. And so I, I went home and I watched it and I was, like, blown away. It was prior to that, I think I'd maybe seen, like, one or two brackage films, which I love now, but at the time it was kind of like, it just felt very irrelevant to my life. And so there was a sort of entry point there. It was only later that I realized he's not like, his body of work is much different than that, but that initial like kernel was there. Um, as I got deeper into things, I mean, so many filmmakers, I'd have to say 16 millimeter wise, um, Shirley Clark, uh, Bruce Bailey, uh, really big, um, not so much for his films, but his just life output way of being, definitely Harry Smith maybe. Um, and then I, um, more recently, someone who I actually had a chance to spend a lot of time with and learn directly from um, in a colleague sense was a filmmaker named Peter Hutton who uh, spent a great deal of time sort of traveling the world and um, making films and he was a close friend. He recently passed and uh, I think, you know, in the last five or six years, he's been my 
primary uh, influence. Not so much, again, in the sense of like watching his movies, but being able to spend a lot of time with him and see how he worked and what he was all about and kind of bringing a certain slowness into my practice. You, uh, your films include a barrage of images, also text. So do you think that does the text like inform the image? Does the image like inform the text? How does they like meet? Yeah, I mean, for me, I like to use text um, primarily. It's a sort of economic situation, not so much financial, but just c trying to keep the work as lean as possible. I think sometimes, you know, you can make one sentence, you put it in a piece, and you're free to kind of work with the image in a looser way. Whereas, you know, if you study film in a conventional sense, if you're making a, a film, maybe you start with like an extreme wide shot that says, you know, you see the Eiffel Tower or something in the distance. You say, okay, we're in Paris. And then you cut and you see some other marker that lets you know. And then finally, you know, four shots in, you see a couple sitting at a table, right? And then you say, okay, they're in a cafe in Paris, right? Um, but you could just say, here we are in Paris, and then cut to whatever, you know, you could cut to the scene right here, and it just saves a lot. So then you don't, you know, then you can make images do other things rather than just simply explain where we are or just kind of push in a different direction. So I don't necessarily know that they're meant to be uh, a situation where, like, the text then informs a series of images. It's kind of like, um, I just want to get this thought in. And so the text, I think, sort of, intervenes or gives enough of a push um, of what I'd like to communicate, but um, yeah, I just don't necessarily want the films to be any longer than they need to be. Um, and so in some ways I think, um, it's not, I don't think of it as cheating, but just kind of saying like, what's wrong with just sometimes saying things very clearly and directly to an audience and then letting the images do other things. And, you know, alongside the text and the visual, it feels like the, the soundscapes that you create are equally important. And even though in both films they've, they felt very silent and kind of melan melancholy, I feel like they also inform the story that was kind of unfolding in front of us. So can you kind of speak to, um, you know, what instruments you decide to use for, for each film and why? And it seemed like the drum was a big um, part of Kenda, um, also visually. So can you speak to that? Sure. Um, I generally try to edit my films silent um, so I don't have a sense of what the sound is going to be. And I shoot without sound. I don't record. I shoot all of my films with a Bolex camera that doesn't have, you, you can't record sound onto the camera. So sometimes I record field recordings independent of the shoot, but more times than not, I just don't record sound. I record the images. Um, with Many Thousands Gone, I had a whole picture, it was done, and I was actually had a film print of it, 16 millimeter print, and I was showing it to friends, and, uh, and I found, you know, you show it to friends and you have a portable film projector, it's a pretty loud machine. If we had one in here during the screening, we would all be very aware of it. Um, and so I found that when I transferred to video or projected it in a space where the projector wasn't in the same room, it was like really, didn't make any noise, and I found it kind of, troubling. I didn't, like I had realized over the course of say editing it over six months that I had become attached to the mechanical sounds that the projector was making. Um, around that time I just, you know, I was just at my local bar in the town I live in. Uh, Joe McPhee happened to be playing down the street and I'm like, great, you know, I'll take a break from editing and all this, I'll go see Joe. And um, it almost was very similar to hear the sound it was quite soft. He was in a bar and it was very quiet the way he plays. And you couldn't hear him at points, but he just kept playing. He was clearly involved in his process, but at points, as an audience member, you couldn't hear it. Other points, you could. And uh, there was something about that experience that made me think of the way that I was interacting with the projector when projecting my film. It was kind of there and not there at the same time. Um, and so I approached him afterwards, and you know, we were talking a bit. And, uh, and he was like, yeah, I'll take a look at your film or whatever. And uh, so we came up with this thing where I would give him the silent film. We went to a studio together. And the idea, the concept was that he would use the images as they play out as a score and just kind of sight read my film. And we did two takes. And then what you hear is um, either the two takes combined or an alteration between one of the two. Um, with many, or with Kinda, um, I really enjoyed working with 
a musician and I was trying to work with someone, um, but he was in Los Angeles, I'm out here, and uh, we couldn't get the studio time together, so I was like, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'm gonna take records and chop them up, you know, and then I'm gonna make a score and I'll give it to you so you know like what I have in mind, you know? Um, and again, the film was done silent and I had this record that I sort of kept re-editing and re-editing and then I had some field recordings that I had made in the village as well. And uh, by the time I finished making the mock-up to like give to him, um, I was like, actually, you know, it would, the only difference would be that he's playing the drums as opposed to what I made. Um, and so that's a, a performance by um, a drummer named uh, Jerome Cooper that I re-edited um, snippets of his drum solos um, and rearranged them to kind of make a new score for it. Um, but again, I was trying to keep a certain loose live performance element to it. Um, still not sure if I'll get the other drummer to do the score, but I'm happy with the way it sounds. Again, it would be one of those things where only if I told you would you be able to really know much of a difference. But um, within what we were talking about before, about the sort of improvised music that I think informed the American avant-garde from the beginning, it's something that I've always been interested in in general, and, and when I have opportunities to work with um, some of these musicians, particularly some of the elders within that community, I always try to do that and kind of, if I can make the films intergenerational in some way, I do. In some of the earlier films in the series, I worked with an actor, and so I felt like with working with musicians, it was like a bit more collaborative in that way. Yeah, I mean, uh, you brought up such an interesting point about jazz kind of being the uh, backbone, back backbone to a lot of um, avant-garde expression, you know, even thinking of abstract painting and that history and that that ongoing collaboration with uh, jazz musicians and that kind of being the great American genre. So, um, yeah, just really interesting. Um, but, yeah, we'll, we'll open it up to questions. If anyone has questions about the films, for Effie, for us, yeah. Hi. During the process of making a film, what did you learn about yourself during the entire process? Um, well, the films are still in process, so I think I'm still learning a lot from it. But um, it's hard to say. I mean, so much, so much. I mean, I think as people especially I think as, as black people in the United States, I, I, I think we have this sort of love-hate relationship with space. Um, and so I think, you know, sometimes it's like, you know, I mean, even by what we're labeled as such, like African-American, it's a sort of indecisive place to be, you know, like, which is it, you know? Um, or at least it raises that question, or is it both? And for me in making these films, it's like, I think in my younger days, it used to be like, well, I'm not really from here, like I, I, you know, or like, you know, certain people win elections and you're like, fuck it, I'm out of here, you know what I mean? Like, um, I'm gonna go back some other place or move and repatriate or whatever the case may be. But I think for me and my travels, um, not in a way, I think sometimes people take this the wrong way when I say it, but um, a certain sense of like uh, ownership of the space that I was born into and the history that we've established here as being very vital and key to the global situation of being a part of a diaspora, that it's important to sort of maintain these posts on every front. It's not, for me, about clustering into one specific place or that sort of thing. Um, and just how complicated and sophisticated all of these places are, I think um, a lot of it, I think it's like, um, for me, the process of just kind of coming to terms again with what it means to be um, I like, I don't like to refer to myself as African American. I mean, I, that's something that I think I, just a definitive takeaway, I prefer to be called black um, than African American. Um, I think it has a lot to do with making these films, um, which is to say there's definitely a lot of universal uh, culture and I don't, I don't know, it's just these separations that we make I find to be kind of problematic and so it's something that I feel more than I, um, like it's not an intellectual position for me to be in. It's something that I think just from experience, it's how I feel. So I think, I mean, to answer it in short, I feel like I'm more in tune with my feelings about black culture than what I feel like I've read or learned or experienced through media. It's like, it's more direct. 
many other things, but that's something. Uh, this is sort of going off what you've um, just been talking about, but you were filming in, say, Brazil and Jamaica, you know, countries that have their, you know, there's black people in those countries, but they obviously have their own sort of culture and their own sort of identity apart from, you know, what you might see in America or in Africa. So my question is, how was it, how was the challenge of, you know, making sure that you were able to preserve their own specific identities while also telling your story of, you know, a broader diaspora? Thanks, yeah, I appreciate that question. Um, some of that, I think, for me, I mean, assuming that I'm doing it in any way that people feel from the cultures being represented comfortable with, like, you know, um, a part of my process, and the, one of the reasons I like to shoot on film is that um, it's kind of, no, it's not kind of, it's an expensive way to work, however, um, if you don't shoot a lot of film, it's not that expensive. So I find that when I'm working in a place like Jamaica or Brazil, for, let's say if I'm there for two weeks, I might shoot a total of maybe 25 minutes of footage, you know, and so I'm rarely there with my camera in front of my face, getting in people's business. Most of the time I'm observing or interacting with people, and maybe for five or 10 minutes a day, I take the camera out and do a little something, or if there's an event, you know, obviously I have to do that. But I really, really, really try to work hard to build a rapport with people. Most of the people that you see, even if they look like, you know, um, they're just random people, they've probably seen me before, talked to me before, and so I think there's a certain, um, I like to wait till I feel a certain amount of rapport with the people that I, I'm in the community with. And I tend to not move very far, so when I'm working, like when I was shooting in Brazil, I was probably operating in the few weeks that I was there, I probably stayed within a five mile, 10 mile radius. I didn't go very far. Um, in Jamaica, I'd been there a lot, but again, where I was working, it's like I was just in the village, you know, and not moving around very much. And you know, you can only get so much, you know, if you're not from a place and you don't live there. But again, I try to really just take my time and not try to do too much. And I also don't really try to represent their culture as an insider, like here I am telling you about this maroon culture. I try to have the films also stay a bit outside. So in almost all of my work, they're in these places, but they also cut to whatever happens to be going on in my life here as well. So in the Jamaica film, there are shots of like outside of a sort of beat up building a little bit. Um, that's my apartment. And so it's like, you know, I'm always kind of trying to bounce the films back and forth and keep a certain amount of distance while maintaining a certain degree of respect for the the people there in terms of just kind of observing and not trying to be so much a represent, like to, to represent their stories. Um. Hi, um, I have a question for the curators. Um, you talked a little bit about like the um, history of the concept, Robin D.G. Kelly's book, Rad Black Radical Imagination. Um, and I'm wondering how you choose the films themselves and like what kind of aesthetic qualities you're looking for. Is that an easy process, a difficult process? Is it friends? What kind of, yeah, just those questions, yeah. I would say it's a, a like, mixture of all those things. Um, me and Aaron have uh, like different tastes in the in our in our like film selections and things we're interested in as uh, like programmers, so we uh, like send each other things or our friends send us things and we just sh and we share them and we see how they have this like collective language together uh, that speaks to the overall project and also in, in conceiving a program like how the films uh, like interact uh, like with each other. Yeah, so each year has a theme. Um, the first year we were honing in on this idea of Afrofuturism. Um, the second year we were working off of this idea of Afro-surrealism, which um, there's a manifesto written about Afro-surrealism by... Um, D. Scott Miller. D. Scott Miller, thank you, based in San Francisco. 
Um, last year, we were working off of this notion of the black body in media, um, mainly in response to police violence. So how is the black body in the media represented without its consent or our consent? Um, and this is a special program that we put together for today, but um, this year's program is really honing in on uh, black women and their stories, and it's mainly, um, it's a lot of stories in response to their mothers and the matriarchal figures in their life. Um, so we're, we really just, you know, kind of put our heads together at the beginning of the year and think about what's going on culturally and socially in this moment and, and how can we respond to it. And um, like Amir was saying, like over these past four years, we've been able to kind of work with the core collective of filmmakers and really see their work grow and prosper. And it's been amazing. Like it's been amazing to work with Effie and just see like his ongoing series and this search. And um, I think a big thing for me is like, texture. Um, so there's a lot of 16 millimeter in this particular um, program. I love, I love that texture and I think, you know, it's this response to um, historically how, you know, the film camera and the lens was not really designed to respond to black skin. Um, so there's this ongoing search for that too and, and, and looking at cinematography that really highlights and glorifies uh, black folks. Hi. Who are you? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm just wondering, like in the political climate, do you think there's a need to reimagine or I mean, things have shifted. What is your take on black radical imagination kind of moving forward? I think it's an ongoing thing of just constantly like evolving, expanding, the, uh, like thinking about like the black imagination and just how it exists. Um, like, like just within the frame of, you know, films and, and things like that. So it's always things to like, I like build upon. And I think every program has pretty much like evolved like uh, like from the last one and approaching different uh, like cultural aspects and thinking about like the current like condition of society whether they're like political or social or anything so yeah uh, and I would argue that the climate hasn't shifted that it's actually been on this ongoing cyclical thing for years um, especially for black folks and black people in America and um, the diaspora and this ongoing struggle that we have with oppression. Um, and so again, what Amir was saying, I feel like the imagination being the key factor in, in um, you know, how this program is put together and that being the kind of agency that um, we're working with in terms of how the filmmakers are responding to um, the political sphere, I, I would say even that the, the, the biggest shift happened um, these past eight years when you have, you know, someone who um, is the, the leading figure of this country and is represented and uh, responded to as a black man. And so you see um, this kind of uh, coming back to the active citizen, but you see it from both sides. You see it from the Tea Party to Black Lives Matter. And I would say that has been the biggest political shift in my life personally, and I feel like this will be another political shift, but um, I feel like the shift in culture is something that historically we've dealt with for years. Um, to that, I just wanted to kind of uh, echo the same thing. I mean, I think, um, the climate in this country has been going in a certain direction for quite a while now. And um, like we were just listening to, you know, it was playing when we came in, the new Tribe Called Quest album. Half of the songs sound like they wrote them last week, you know? Um, and that's because, you know, they're responding to the climate that, you know, just kind of got uh, exploded in a way a week ago. And so I think, you know, with a program like this, I mean, I think the work has already been happening and it's just a matter of staying at it and trying to magnify some of these things. Um, now, I mean, just 
personally speaking a, a little bit, I mean, outside of what I feel like I'm doing with my work per se, I mean, there's definitely a lot of excess that we could probably all do without in terms of what we consume as media and place that energy into um, better places. But again, these are things that I think we should always be doing. And I think, you know, a lot of what's happening now, um, I mean, it's not good at all. Um, it's, it's awful, but um, it, it, it's put a situation in front of us where we can't avoid it. You can't pretend it's not there. It's hard to avoid, and in that way, um, it's an important moment. But, um, but again, I think, you know, like I, I work with a lot of college students, and some of them, we had a meeting the other day, and a lot of them, for the first time in their lives, are like, I'm afraid of the police or this sort of thing, you know, or people, you know, intimidating me. And again, as Aaron was saying, it's like, well, you know, that's, that's our history in this country, you know, and so it, it shouldn't be. Uh, new or alarming or surprising or necessarily make certain people have to work very differently than they have been. Um, so I'm mostly interested to see who says nothing at this point in time. Um, that's what I'm looking at, you know. Any? Hello, this one's for Effie. Um, in regards to your film, or really art making in general, I have this notion that we create in response to a lot of things. And I think as, especially as black artists, I think we're categorized as very reactionary art, whatever. Um, but in your work, it seems very much more explorative of something, almost as if you're searching for something rather than a uh, reaction to something per se. I'm just interested if that's true or not, or what exactly that almost your intent is when you do make these films. Like, what are you trying to show, or what are you trying to find for yourself? So, um, thanks for saying that. I appreciate it. Um, for me, I mean, first and foremost, I mean, I think I'm trying to come from a place of just to be like whatever about it, like really profound love of my culture, not so much um, because of its, uh, not in contrast to anyone else's culture. It's like I'm not really interested in making films that say, well, these people do things this way, these people do things that way, let's you know, see which one is better. It's like I'm not interested in that thing when I'm making a film, I'm interested in this thing. And as such, I just want to sort of make something about that. And so, you know, I'm not so much um, reacting to, um, you know, like, again, like an election or something like that. It's like we have a long history of resistance, and it's been done quite beautifully for hundreds or thousands of years, depending on how you look at it. And that's something that's always been just beautiful and fascinating to me, the way that that's worked. And all of the films are shot in these locations of um, resistance. Now, in a wider sense, clearly what's being resisted is this sort of outside influence. But, and this is something that I think we're all going to get really good at in the next four years, is there's a way of resisting and not talking to your oppressor and just saying, look, like, we're just talking about how much we care about each other. And it doesn't have to be, you know, and look what you did. You know, it can just be like, we're having a private conversation here. And, you know, it is what it is. Um, and I feel like for me, the films are a bit of a, not a private conversation in terms of people are excluded from the experience, but I'm not necessarily looking to tell anyone anything about, you know, anything. It's just, this is something that I'm interested in. This is something that I find fascinating or beautiful. And I'm just trying to focus on that. I'm not trying to say anything. I mean, as an artist, you screen in places like this or anywhere, you know, really for the most part. And more times than not, the audience is uh, majority um, white people, not African Americans or people of color. Most of the time, that's the case. And so you do have a situation where you're making the work, and obviously it's not screening into certain contexts. So I'm not pretending like that's the case. But what I'm saying is I'm not necessarily interested in um, addressing certain concerns in terms of that are outside of uh, black culture with this body of work, per se. Um, 
finishing the last one now, that's a bit different. But, um, but for the most part, they've been sort of, in a way, like insular stories. And in some of the stories being depicted, they're not stories that are widely represented in terms of um, history, uh, you know, you know, Haile Selassie in Ethiopia. It's like anybody, you don't learn about that in school, you know. Um, you don't learn about the Maroons and their ways of doing science, medicine, et cetera, in school. These are things that uh, people have taught each other more or less orally, and so I'm trying to kind of stay within that space where it's not like, you know, let me expose this scholarship to other people or do it in any way that's anything other than kind of like trying to just kind of share some of the beauty that I get to feel and experience through it with people who might be interested in that. And so it's not in reaction to anything other than it's coming from that place. Because again, for years I was having these experiences, but I wasn't a filmmaker, so I didn't know what to do with them in a way. And then the camera kind of came into my life, and it's like, oh, some connections happened, and then I'm trying to work through the series that way. You know? Thank you guys for uh, throwing this today. I think it's a, a special event uh, to have this opportunity to showcase black art. Um, my question, you talked about uh, not shooting a lot, especially because you shoot on film. That seems to be a specific choice, um, a very specific choice that I'm wondering, how do you feel that that translates the experience for the viewer as opposed to you as the filmmaker who gets to experience things when the camera's not on. Do you think you translate those experiences, you know, to the viewer as well? Um, thanks, that's a great question. Um, yeah, I think that for me, uh, I shot, I used to shoot lots of video, like I made most of my work in video before film, and you know, I might shoot, you know, I made a film that ended up being, or a video, 30 minutes long, and I probably shot 40 or 50 hours of videotape which isn't that bad in terms of what some people do, but um, I find that when you have a lot of footage, all you, it gets to the point, it's like this puzzle, it becomes so big that um, you fall into a sort of conventional sense of storytelling just to kind of get through the footage oftentimes, you know, just to make sense of it. Um, but I feel, or at least that's how it was for me. Um, but I found that when I work with film, the sort of forced, um, uh, sort of economy of shooting, um, I think it makes the work sort of inherently poetic because um, it's like there are huge gaps in information, you know. And so when you get your footage back, it's kind of like, you know, a minute here, a minute there. You shot this one thing and there's a certain rhythm to it um, that I think for me has come with doing it a lot that uh, when I get it back, I feel like it exists more in the space of like when you try to remember something, you know, and it's like you get bits and pieces, you know, you don't get... You know, like uh, if you think about what you ate for breakfast, you know, you don't necessarily see the whole room where you were or whatever. You know, you might think of a plate and, uh, you know, an egg, a fork, you know, a few things. You don't see the whole room, in, or at least I don't in my imagination when I'm mem using my memory. And so I think it sort of shifts the work automatically into this sort of place of memory, uh, poetics, etc. That's much more for me interesting because, again, I'm very reluctant to try to make the work seem like here I am to tell you all about these places and spaces that I've been to, you know, it's more like, what is it like to think about other places? What is it like to be here and think about somewhere else? Like some of you are maybe hungry, right? And it's like, you're watching a movie, but you're thinking about a cheeseburger. So it's like, in a film, you can put the cheeseburger in the same space with the screening. It's like, and so that's the kind of space that I think, for me, working in film has opened up. Whereas I think with video, it was always about this sort of linear, this happened and then that happened. And, you know, with the film, it's just kind of like you have to just throw that out of the back, out of the window, because you can't. Um, you, it, it's too expensive to tell a linear story in that way for me. Um, so I kind of, yeah, try to fuse that all together. Thank you, guys. Thank you all so much. Yeah. Thanks to the technical crew and all the curators. <laughs> thanks so much. Also, uh, like, thanks to uh, like Taja Cheek for like inviting us here and uh, everybody, the whole Mom staff. Thanks. <laughs>